you are and to whom you are going to address the question. Uh, yes. Do you hear me okay? Uh, Tom Young, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, came from the educational experience. Uh, my part of the question is with the success of all the efforts of sustainability in the circular industries that have come out of Europe primarily and I assume in other countries, what is being done to possibly influence the maybe third world developing countries, maybe in the Africa type of percentage that you were looking at that will be ready to migrate if the economies don't prove and agriculture doesn't prove, and other countries that are canning and processing pies. Is there, are they being influenced by what has what has originated and started in Italy and uh, Europe in the sustainable effort? Or is there a movement in a way to try to make sure that they are sustainable with their environment and don't try necessarily, if it gets more competitive with a shortage of highs, to maybe be processing without that sustainability effort just so they can be a better e e economically or cheaper product? Thank you. I think we're going to give this question to Federico. First, one, one position. Um, you are, we are here in the World Leather Congress, and the World Leather Congress is a product of the International Council of Standards. So that's the, the international leather community that is reunited and is organized and tries to be the governance body of the industry. Of course, the uh, footprint of the industry is not equal in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, in Asia, in, in a number of countries. And there is much to improve in, in certain countries of, of the environmental footprint of its sustainability performance. But we are trying to do that. Europe is probably one, Europe and not only Europe, also the United States are providing quite a lot of aid and cooperation to countries around the world that need to improve their environmental performance. And Africa is probably one of them that, re, that is a big receiver of cooperation funds in order to improve the, the performance of the, and, and we hope that these countries really take up this opportunity for improving their, 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 their footprint and their, their image. Because actually, nobody in the leather industry can afford that there are hot spots anywhere because that repercutes on the rest of the industry. People don't think that uh, uh, the industry, maybe let's say in an imaginary country, Bangla uh, is bad. No, they think that leather is bad because what happens there may happen also in other countries. That is very bad for the image of the industry. We need to try all together to cooperate in order to eradicate these hotspots in the world. But maybe, uh, Felipe, you want to? Yeah, I have like 10 seconds left. Basically, the, 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 the leather industry grows where the raw material is, so the, the leather industry is actually distributed worldwide, but concentrated in some areas. Maybe uh, the fact that, uh, for example, African tanneries are worse than others, uh, maybe not true because there are also very big installations worldwide in which state-of-the-art technologies are, uh, are operated. And um, so that uh, you shouldn't think about, you know, parts of the world in which you see still the traditional way of leather making that you may find in Fez in Morocco, which uh, hundred years ago people were like pushing leather with feet. This doesn't happen anymore. And uh, the head leather making is a capital intensive uh, business, so that uh, especially for countries uh, that have uh, livestock uh, and uh, that export semi processed material, the capital needed and the returns are, uh, are may, may be kind of secured, so that they, may, they are uh, also good investments for funds. And the sustainability also in terms of uh, environmental performance as a business is also uh, a business security issue. So uh, a business to run has to be sustainable and in compliance with law. Uh, big corporations, a lot of money uh, needed to run the business. 60% is running capital. Uh, so so that maybe this is one second in which it is true there are still still some uh, countries in which their improvement is needed and in this case the uh, United Nations uh, World Bank are already working for capaci capacity building or training programs. So 
but it's may, maybe it's an, it's an example in which the, the state of the art technologies are better distributed than other sectors. Michael, please. Michael. Hello, Hello. Michael Duck, uh, Asia Pacific Love Affair, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. Um, thank you for a fascinating presentation. It's really uh, thought, thought uh, stimulating. And of course, many worries and concerns that have uh, are behind us there and have been for many years in terms of population flows and also in terms of future uh, uh, agricultural needs. Um, and uh, just in regards to your last statement there, I was in Rubiki City in, in Cairo last week and it was fascinating in terms of the improvements that have gone on there, in terms of making places better. And I think that's incumbent on all of us as citizens of the world, we have to make those places better, so therefore that they don't have these flows in the future. But my questions are for Professor Middleman. Um, the One of the gases that you, uh, you, you had on the initial uh, card there was the CFCs. Now, you didn't mention CFCs, because I suppose because we've actually improved that situation globally, so it can be done as I understand, uh, by not having chlorofluorocarbons in refrigerators, etc., the hole is now closing and the ozone is there. Um, are there things that can be done in regards to the fossil fuels? And one of the clear, frightening statements that you said was that 22% of these uh, 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 carbons came from the cement and concrete industry. Isn't that something which initially, you know, you can do something about, but what do we replace it with? Because that's a, an enormous percentage. Yeah, so first of all, we do we have made huge improvements on many different fronts. One of them you mentioned, um, we have also made huge improvements with respect to methane. Okay, so we know what we need to do to make animals more efficient. Just like we have learned to make cars more efficient, more fuel efficient, we're now making cars more efficient. We can feed certain feed additives that reduce enteric methane so that they belch less methane. We can reduce methane from their manure. It's really true. Uh, the 22% was not just the cement, it was industry overall, but the cement industry is a large, large player in this. And there are certain countries uh, where there are um, situations occurring that are truly staggering. For example, China in three years has used the same amount of cement as the United States in the last hundred years. In three years, the same as in a hundred years. That's not me pointing fingers. I love China, I'm spending a lot of time there. But I'm telling you that growth that, earth, that, that occurs in parts of the world is so immense that the resulting environmental challenges are as well. So we do have to find ways of improving performance, not just in this sector and in livestock, but in, across sectors. I think fossil fuel, use will decrease over time. I think we will get to zero emissions in fossil fuels in the next couple decades, and then livestock will stick out a little, a little more than it is currently, because the other uh, sectors can be addressed relatively easier. So, sorry, can I just, just finish on my question? Just one more, in short time then. Um, and, and that is in terms of geography, uh, as against the population increases. Uh, there are large areas of the world which have no agriculture at all, such as in Russia, a, a massive country. Uh, do you see in the future that we will have to be buying agricultural land there in which to feed the masses in all of these areas where we'll have 10 billion population for the future? Well, I think that we can satisfy the human nutritional needs with the land we have currently, but we have to do it more efficiently. We have to do it more efficiently. And the first step to doing this is for people in countries like this one to really understand the importance of efficiency in food production. People need to stop having that romanticized view of agriculture, thinking of the 1950 red barn in the background, animals on grass, having a good old time. Uh, those times are literally over because we were painfully inefficient during those times. We also must stop that humanizing of livestock. They are not our buddies, they are our food. <laughs> like it or not, they are our food. And so, uh, but we are portraying livestock as if they were our buddies. 
And that's not helping anyone here because uh, then people don't want to wear it, right? People don't want to eat it. They don't want to eat their buddies. I'm not being facetious, I really mean that. Okay. We have to portray them as what they are. They are food and they are fiber and they are leather and they are products that we use to dress and that we use to eat. And everything else we need to stop doing. Thank you very much. Uh, the micro to this. Uh, may I ask you to be very short because yeah. I think we we are overdrawn quite a lot on our session. Thank you. I'm Stephen Tilley. I'm the editor of a magazine called Water Weather. Um, Frank, I'd like to ask you one quick last question. The uh, context of what you just said about uh, people not wanting to wear or eat their friends and the context that Federico mentioned of the leather community possibly being worried about uh, the raw material volumes diminishing. Uh, it's been an extremely interesting year watching your battles with heat, Lancet, etc, etc. You've also mentioned that there are elements of uh, some of the arguments coming out of, of um, commissions like that and uh, of reminding you of a cult. If you can't combat them with reason and science the way you've been working so hard to do all year, if, if reason and science won't work, what can we do to convince them? Well, I will never say, as a scientist, I will never say that reason and science doesn't work, otherwise I would retire right now. <laughs> but I am very clear that these are not the only tools that we can use to sway uh, and to inform a public. A lot of what makes people choose what they eat or what they wear is emotional. It is emotional. And uh, for industries like this one here, not to consider emotional arguments would be negligent. Okay? That's just the, the simple fact. And so I think we have to stop just being fact-based and science-based and we have to open ourselves as to what makes people feel the way they feel, buy the things they buy. You know, I, I teach this class at UC Davis, 300 students, uh, they all want to become veterinarians. They all want to become veterinarians. Why? Because they grew up with a cat and dog and they love that animal so much. But guess what? They don't consider that an animal. They don't consider that a pet. They consider that a family member. A family member. And they would do anything for that animal to save it. So this is the mindset that the general public has. They don't understand animals anymore. These are all family members. And if we now depict animals in animal agriculture, the way they look, you know, they look at their pets, like calves with big floppy ears and big white eyes, and everybody is now humanized, then guess what? Nobody wants to eat or wear that. It's that simple. So let's stop doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.